On this week's episode of Whitetail Cribs, we're headed to West Virginia to visit with Tanner Burns. Tanner is a taxidermist who has an unmatched passion for turkey hunting. He's currently seven states away from completing the U.S. Turkey Slam. This episode should get everyone fired up for this upcoming turkey season. Get ready to see an amazing taxidermy studio full of West Virginia bucks and gobblers from across the nation. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. The Exodus team is traveling around the United States to take a look inside the trophy rooms of some of the most interesting whitetail hunters in the country. From giant bucks, unique racks, and riveting stories, welcome to Whitetail Cribs. Hey, hey, come on in, guys. Welcome to the shop slash crib here. Okay, my name's Tanner Burns. I'm the owner of Full Draw Taxidermy in Buckhannon, West Virginia. And I guess you could say I have a little bit of a turkey obsession. I'll come this way, I'll show you the workshop area over here. We've got a turkey going in here. So you can see a little bit of the process of how we put a turkey together. Um, so right here is where we would do the skinning on a fresh bird uh, when you bring them in. We use these shackles to hang them up. We can do all of our skinning and then either freeze them till we're ready to go. Over here you can see how we got one, uh, how we got one set up. So three things that people don't realize when they're getting a turkey mount. Uh, you're detaching three things. You're detaching the legs, you're detaching the head, and you're detaching the tail and those th all three of those things come together to make the mount. Uh, we'll start up here at the head. Uh, so we use all freeze dried heads. Um, we don't use anything artificial. A lot of, or some taxidermists will use fake heads, but people seem to really uh, like the freeze dried heads better. Uh, so we got a freeze dried head that goes on this insert. Uh, and you see we get the position and the pose and everything all put together before the mount. Uh, even happens. Uh, we got his legs bondoed into the form and kind of put in position and then his tail is actually bondoed too uh, and then you can just put it off so if you want him uh, in half strut or whatever pose you want uh, we can do whatever you need to with the tail. Uh, really depends on what attitude the bird's in whether he's gobbling, uh, standing and over here we got a skin um, so this skin, this is a skin that we're going to be using um, on that bird right there. Uh, tomorrow morning I'm going to come out here and uh, put him together. But if you look here, we had to, uh, to de-meat his wings. Um, and then we'll run wires through his wings. And that's what will let us manipulate whether he's got his primaries down to the ground or whether he's got his primaries folded up and half strut. Um, and turn them inside out and I'll kind of show you um, how we get rid of all the fat. If you look at his skin, uh, you can see all of his feather quills are demeated. Uh, we'll rub borax on the skin to preserve it before we go through the mounting process. Uh, but to do a really good turkey mount, uh, you have to have all those feather quills exposed so that you can manipulate them uh, when it comes time to put them on the form like that. But we'll go over here and I'll show you real quick a little bit about um, how you get the meat off of there. Uh, seems like everybody's got a different process to do a turkey. Uh, but if you come, sorry, bouncing around here. Uh, I have a chair that I set here and this is a wire wheel. And behind this wire wheel, um, I've got it kind of jerry-rigged to a fourth of a horsepower motor back there <laughs> and uh, we'll just flip it on it's unplugged right now and actually you just wire wheel um, that skin or that meat off of there until you get a real nice looking skin like that um, and then <laughs> the fun part after that I just got done doing this morning um, a lot of people don't realize you have to wash a turkey um, before you go through the mounting process. So after I get done fleshing, uh, I'll come over here. Uh, I've got a double utility sink here and I will completely submerge this turkey 
in cold and hot water, uh, about lukewarm temperature, and wash him to completely get rid of all the blood and all the, uh, the nastiness on his feathers, whether it be dirt or grime or whatever happened after the shot. Um, and we'll wash him over here. And as soon as we get rid of all the blood and everything like that, it usually takes about seven or eight rinses. We'll take powdered Tide, um, and then the last rinse actually goes with powdered Tide. Uh, and that gets his feathers all nice and shiny uh, and put together. So <laughs> after we get done doing that, you'll see I have an old washing machine over here. The only thing that works on that washing machine is the spin cycle. <laughs> so after I wash him, I'll throw him in here, uh, put him on two spin cycles. And what the spin cycle does is it gets rid of some of the water off of his feathers uh, to save me uh, during the drying process. Because as you can imagine, once you wash this thing, he gets, uh, he gets super, super saturated as far as the feathers go. So when that time comes, um, I've made a, uh, I've made a little bit of a tool on my skin and thing here. So I got two clips. I'll clip them in between the humerus. Or wait a second, the radius and the ulna. Yeah, not the humerus. Humerus is behind these. Yeah, I'll clip it in between the radius and the ulna. Um, so I'll have those exposed like that. Let me get them turned back right side out here. Then I have little wire hooks up top here. So I'll hook his, he his head skin up here and I'll take these hooks, spread his wings completely out like this. Run one of those hooks through that wing. Run one of these through this wing here. Should have, I'm gonna have some taxidermists stealing my ideas after this. Should have thought this through before I showed everyone. Oh. Get this one hung up here. There we go. Yeah, so what this does, once I get them kind of put back up like this, I'll take my box fan there and I'll let this box fan run on him for about, I don't know, an hour or so. And then I'll come back in with a hair dryer. Come back in. I just did this before you guys got here. I'll come in with the hair dryer. You see, I got them already. I've already got them completely dry. Uh, or, or 90% of the way dry, but you finish it off with a uh, with a hair dryer. So some of my buddies call me sometimes to say, "Hey man, I'm just blow drying a turkey." As bizarre as that is, so after you get him uh, after you get him about 90% of the way dry, we'll take him back off these uh, this shackle here. Bring him back over to my table. We already talked about the wires that go in each wing. Um, but after I get those wires in, uh, I'll flip them back over and I will go ahead and preen. Uh, for those of you turkey nuts out there, you know a turkey preens. But I will preen his, his wings before the mounting process because it'll make it a lot easier. As you can see, I've got his wings looking pretty nice, or at least this one. That one's uh, got some shot damage. But this one, I'll just take tweezers and I'm looking to find all the feather tracks right here. So as you see, I'm trying to get really nice straight lines there. So I'm just taking my tweezers, lifting these feathers up until I get nice straight lines. And I've already got this one done, but at the beginning of the process, you wouldn't have these nice, beautiful lines like that. And if you don't get your um, turkey all the way clean and all the way washed, um, his feathers won't, won't be near this nice. They'll be crinkly or They'll still have blood on them, so really getting your turkey clean is one of the most important uh, parts of the whole process, which I think some taxidermists might skimp on, but it's worth it if you just take a little extra time when you're cleaning them. So at this point, I would wire his wings in, um, and I would come over here, and I'd be ready to put him on the form, which we've already talked about, but I do want to touch on uh, the head painting over here. So I'll get a couple different poses out of here. So a freeze dried head. Um, we don't do our freeze drying here. We send our heads off to get freeze dried. Uh, but when they come out of the freeze dryer, this is what a turkey head looks like. So you can see he's lost almost all of his color during the freeze drying process, which means you have to put the color back in there. Uh, so you have to let your freeze dryer know beforehand 
what pose you want them in. This will kind of be like a three quarter strut. And this will be gobbling pose. And then we've got a strut pose I'm getting ready to work on over here. Uh, and then after you get your pose, you come over here. I'll get this kind of where I got my paint station happening here. I'll sit down here and uh, I'll airbrush and I'll use my airbrush here and I'll use pan pastels and this is kind of the finished product uh, that you get when you're done. It's usually about a two hour process um, getting that paint on there and getting them how they're supposed to be. But I printed off a bunch of reference photos here behind me so I can kind of look at what I'm thinking about doing. Uh, I don't really like to have a lot of a harsh red color, even though a turkey will have uh, a really bright red color. I prefer to do like a like a subtle red on mine. I just think it looks more natural. But all these reference photos here, really, if you look at the head on all these turkeys, <laughs> every one of them is different. So there's really no right or wrong way to do it. Uh, but a turkey's head can can go a million different directions. I'm sure a lot of you watching this have seen a gobbler appear before you and his head's one color and he might go out go behind a tree and his head's a completely different color so that's the beauty of it there's really no right or wrong way but people seem to like uh, how we go about painting them and it's been a long process learning how to paint them it really has uh, some of the some of the colors that we use um, we use bright red like that and then we use a baby blue color for their cheeks um, and then uh, oh one other thing it's weird you have to go to the makeup section and buy some mascara <laughs> we use it pretty frequently so after you get done painting these uh, the paint sticks to these little hairs that you can see even in the freeze drying process their ears uh, or their ear holes and everything the hair is still on the on the, the skin so that gets paint on it during the airbrushing process and during the pastel process. So I'll come back in here with mascara and just get mascara on those hairs to bring them back, bring them back uh, to their original color. Sometimes I have to go in and bum some mascara off my wife, which probably not too many fellas run into. At least, maybe. Depend on what you're into, I reckon. Uh, and let's go into uh, into the showroom area here. We got a bunch of gobblers uh, on display. We'll start over here on this side. Uh, first off, I'm doing something uh, called the US US Super Slam that some of you guys may have heard about before. But the Super Slam is killing a bird in all 49 states. So I started that journey when I was around 18 and I'm 29 now. I've got 42 states down and I've got seven left. Uh, if all goes well, I've got six states lined up for this spring and uh, hopefully one left for the spring of 2021. So hopefully I'll be finishing it in the, uh, in the next two years. There's only about 13 or 14 people that have ever done it. Uh, and if I can finish it up fairly soon, I'll probably be the youngest person uh, that's ever done it, but there's a lot of people doing it now, so uh, I'm sure that won't stand too long, but I'll get a couple seconds of glory hopefully uh, But over here I have um, I have pictures of each state I've been to so far uh, for customers to look at uh, I think I get a lot of people that uh, that don't believe me when I tell them how old I am and how many states I've been to but uh, I just love turkey hunting. I started traveling at a young age and trying to get a bird in the new state uh, is really a rush going to a new state with two or three days and trying to get a bird. Uh, it, it's not a leisurely activity when you when you hit the ground you know it's a it's a daylight to dark activity trying to get one on the ground and I really enjoy it. I'm not sure what I'll do when it's over with, but uh, I had no intentions of really doing the Super Slam. Uh, I had a friend that was doing it that I met in Alabama. Alabama. His name was Kenny Mount. He's one of the fellows from the Penhody Project. And I started hunting with him, and I went on a couple trips with him when he started his slam. He was probably like 25 or 30 states in, and we went to New Mexico and I'd only been to four or five states at this point. And 
we were having a discussion. I was having a rough trip in New Mexico. It had been like two or three days and I hadn't killed a turkey. And it was during West Virginia season. And I said to him, man, I shouldn't even have came on this trip. If I was in West Virginia, I'd be killing turkeys. And I think it kind of made him uh, a little upset. And he said to me after a few choice words, he said, man, anybody can go to the same state every year and kill a turkey. He's like, you want to be a good turkey hunter? Then you go to a new state with a couple days and that'll show you what you're made of. So uh, I kind of took that to heart after he said that uh, because he was right. You know, a lot of people can go to the same place every year where there's always turkeys and kill them. But going to a completely new area with just a couple days to hunt, uh, not only is it is it exciting, but it'll really show you what you're made of uh, in the turkey woods. But anyway, that's a little bit of the backstory about the slam. A couple birds I have here. Uh, I just competed with this bird uh, in Nashville. Uh, it got second in the Masters. This is actually one of my birds. Uh, so the skin, this bird is kind of a Frankenstein bird because I got bits and pieces of all different types of turkeys on here. So his head is off a Rio I killed in Texas that was freeze dried. His skin and his beard are off an Indiana turkey that I killed last spring. And his spurs uh, are the best spurred turkey that I've ever killed. Uh, I killed this bird probably six years ago in West Virginia. These spurs are just shy of, uh, of two inches. I'll probably never kill another bird like him. But anyway, uh, I knew this pose would really show off the spurs. And when I got this bird mounted, I had by no means figured out how to be a good turkey taxidermist. So uh, the mount looked terrible. And <laughs> so my best spurs were sitting on a terrible turkey mount. So I knew uh, when I got another bird, I would pop those spurs off and put them on a different bird. So um, I think more people at Nashville noticed his... Uh, his spurs and then the whole mount so I'm not sure it was a good idea or not but uh, a cool story behind this bird it was six years ago and it was the second to last day of season on some public land here and this bird I watched him pitch up into a tree uh, the evening before and he had another gobbler with him but late in the season like that the foliage was really on uh, so when I got in there that morning I got in almost right where he flew up from. I was almost sitting under him the next morning, but the trees that he had flew into were so humongous, I couldn't see him up there, and he never gobbled that morning. So as it started breaking daylight and I hadn't heard him, I thought that something, maybe a coyote had came in and bumped him out, and he wasn't there because he never made a sound. So I was ready the entire morning, and about the time that I had convinced myself he was gone, I laid my shotgun in my lap and was gonna pull my phone out or something, you know, decide what my next move was. And it sounded like a B-42 hit the ground about 30 yards from me. He just sailed in and hit the ground. And he was all business just looking around. He's 30 yards from me, my shotgun is laying on my lap. And the other one hit the ground. Uh, so at this point, I'm like, man, I've really screwed this up. Well, as fate would have it, he had a tree to go behind about that big. And he took a path that led him behind that. And the second that he got behind there, I made as quick a move as I could and got my gun up and he didn't have a clue in the world that I was there and he walked out and uh, and I shot him but I never made a call to him or anything it was just uh, that's another thing I think a lot of people like to get in and do some calling but I wanted to survey the situation and have some patience and uh, it just paid off sometimes you don't even have to call to him to kill him uh, as weird as that is uh, these birds here these came from Texas uh, and this one came from Kansas uh, another thing I like to tell people is I fly a lot of frozen turkeys home in my suitcase, which <laughs> a lot of people think that is very odd, which it is. You get a lot of odd looks at the airport, uh, especially if you got to put one in your carry-on and it goes through the little machine there. And they say, what is this? And well, it's a frozen turkey. And nothing illegal about it. You can do it as long as you got your tags. So I flew a lot of them home. Uh, this, uh, this bird here is for a customer, so that's not one of mine. Uh, this turkey down here uh, is from New Hampshire. I got him gobbling like that. Um, this is a customer's bear here. Um, we've got a hanging dead turkey here. I just try to throw in as many poses as I can in here so when a customer comes in here, they can really, uh, they can really decide what pose they want. We've probably got about 10 different poses here in the showroom that they could take a look at. Uh, this bird back here, 
uh, is a pretty cool one. It's a melanistic faced turkey. You can see he's lost uh, a lot of the pigment in his feathers, and he's got kind of a blonde look on the back. So turkeys are uh, just like anything else. They have different color phases. Uh, another one, a uh, popular one, is like a smoke faced turkey. I've never seen a color faced turkey. I have killed a couple that have uh, white primaries, but it seems like a lot of turkeys in uh, West Virginia have those white primaries on them. Uh, but anyway, here's some of my deer mounts uh, on the back wall here. Uh, we do a lot of deer. We probably do more deer than, than we do turkeys, but uh, we'd like to advertise more that we specialize in turkeys. But uh, I think we do do a pretty decent deer, too, if you ever check them out. Uh, this turkey here is also from Texas. Uh, so probably four of these turkeys in here are from Texas. Uh, I have a spot in South Texas that I usually, I usually start my season in every year. And South Texas, uh, chances are if you kill one there, uh, it's going to be a very, very nice turkey to mount because you don't have to worry about them getting wet. Uh, it's always dry in Texas, so usually the feathers stay really nice. Uh, this turkey here was one I competed with in Nashville last year. It is from Nevada and there's another uh, a cool story behind this one so I had to fly him home in my suitcase as well Nevada if you've ever looked into turkey hunting Nevada there is only two counties with turkeys uh, in Nevada and if you apply on public land in Nevada they give one non-resident tag a year to turkey hunt um, I did not draw that tag you can find a landowner and they can agree to sell you their turkey tag through the DNR um, it's a little bit of a process uh, but you can still do it but anyway uh, I managed to get a hold of a landowner tag but when I got to Nevada this landowner had also gave three other people permission to hunt his land and there was one flock of turkeys on this whole thing and we were there really early so it was about a flock of about 130 turkeys I'd say and there was probably 20 long beards or probably more than that to be honest with you but all of us are just kind of watching this flock and nobody knows anybody so everybody's trying to figure out how we're going to do that well I watched those turkeys all evening and Nevada doesn't have a whole lot of trees so there was three trees for 130 turkeys to roost in and they were big trees but anyway when it got dark all those turkeys pitched up into those trees and I'm trying to think how I'm going to beat these other guys to these birds in the morning. Well, as I'm glassing from this hillside watching these birds fly up, I see this big root ball that is directly beneath those turkeys. Uh, and to crawl under a flock of turkeys like that, um, you really have to have it together. So I started my crawl at about 2 a.m. the next morning because it was supposed to break daylight at like 4.30 or 5. But I crawled into that root ball while they were sleeping and I laid there for two hours um, just because I knew that they would probably hit the ground in gun range. But listening to 30 or however many gobblers it was behind me that morning wake up, it was, it was one of the most surreal things. The drumming and the gobbling and just the turkey talk that I heard that morning, I'll never forget. And once they started hitting the ground, I had to shoot one very, very quickly because if I didn't, I was probably going to kill about six or seven of them with one shot. So as soon as the long beard hit the ground, uh, I made sure that it was a, an adult and I, and I shot him and I went out and grabbed him and there was two people on each side of me and I saw him get up and go, but uh, I had to crawl in under him that morning. Uh, moving on down here, this is just a West Virginia bird. Uh, he's got a little bit of attitude to him, uh, kind of like he's about to whoop, whoop up on one. That's a pretty popular pose I've done a good bit of uh, recently. Moving in over here, <laughs> this is another another Texas Rio here. Uh, he's a he's a really a really pretty one there. I really like that mount. We just did that one not too long ago on that stump. Uh, probably not uh, very characteristic of a stump you would find in Texas. I wouldn't imagine, but uh, people don't need to know that, right? <laughs> Other than that. I've been able to show you guys around. I hope you'll look us up on Facebook, Full Draw Taxidermy. If you ever have any questions, give us a shout. And good luck to everybody uh, this spring. I hope you shoot straight, hear a lot of goblin, and have a great time out there. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.